Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar, Financial Reporting Considerations Surrounding the COVID-19 Pandemic. We certainly hope all of you and your loved ones are healthy and safe as we all continue to get through these difficult times. On the top left of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Please feel free to ask questions throughout our presentation and we will attempt to address your questions real time and in any event before the end of the presentation. This webinar will provide you with one credit hour of continuing professional education. We will be asking three polling questions throughout the presentation and it is important that you answer each of the polling questions to receive the continuing professional education credit offered for participating in this webinar. My name is Jesus Socorro and I lead MBAF's Risk and Transaction Advisory Practice and I'll be moderating today's panel. The panelists joining me today are Miguel Velasquez, partner heading up quality control for our audit department, Emma Florea, a partner leading our Risk and Transaction Advisory Practice in New York, and Dennis Barto, a senior in our Risk and Transaction Advisory Practice specializing in technical accounting and internal control matters. The COVID-19 pandemic is affecting major economic and financial markets with widespread effects on almost all industries and governments. Declines in revenues and profit due to shelter in place provisions are likely to be faced by many organizations as are asset impairment risks. During today's webinar, we will discuss certain key accounting and financial reporting considerations related to conditions likely to result from the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also discuss SEC updates, which will be important for those that are affiliated with publicly traded companies. Finally, we'll review financial reporting reminders applicable to this year. We're gonna talk through some major themes that we're seeing a lot out there, a lot of them relating to asset recoverability and valuations, such as goodwill, indefinite life intangibles and long lived assets, fair value measurements of financial assets, such as available for sale securities, equity investments, considering other than temporary impairment indications, things of that nature, inventory, revenue recognition, tax considerations, including deferred tax asset valuation allowance considerations and effective tax rate considerations, lease accounting, which follows a pretty new accounting standard implementation, particularly for public companies, um, impairment and modifications of such contractual arrangements between tenants and landlords, debt covenants and modifications, and subsequent events and going concern considerations for organizations. So I wanna go ahead and have Miguel, why don't you start talking to us a little bit about the impairment model under ASC 360? Sure, thanks Jesus. So, um, you know, I think it makes uh, sense to maybe spend a couple of minutes on the two models that I think most of our clients are gonna be working on uh, really in 2020. So the first model is under ASC 360 and it relates to non-financial assets. And, and this really includes PP&E, finite intangible assets, including right of use assets related to leases uh, with the implementation of ASC 842. So, so really the test happens at the asset group level, and this is typically the lowest level which cash flows can be attributed to a group of assets or asset. And really in most cases, assets will be tested as a group since typically assets work in conjunction with other assets in order to generate a cash flow stream. <clears throat> and really the the test is a trigger-based two-step test and is only completed when a trigger event calls into question whether the value of the asset is not recoverable. So step one. Step one is really the recoverability test. And you're really comparing the undiscounted cash flows attributable to the group of assets to the carrying value of those assets. And only if the undiscounted cash flows are less than the carrying value, you move to step two. Otherwise, you stop at step one. So one, thing, one of the things you should consider is what period of time should we be used in assessing the future, the future cash flows? And the guidance is very prescriptive when it comes to this uh, respect. So companies should use the life of the primary assets, and in most cases, is gonna be the most important asset within the asset group, which is typically the longest uh, lived asset. But one key takeaway from this model is because it's a recoverability test, you're really looking at the cash flows from the perspective of the company and how the company intends to use a group of assets and it's based on the current state of those assets. And, I, and you know, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that. Now, if you proceed to step two and you fail step one, then step two is really a fair value test and it's very different than step one. The cash flows are completed from a market participant's perspective and it's really consistent with ASC 820, which is a fair value standard. <clears throat> now, the cash flows here are not limited to the life of the primary asset. So, as you can imagine, the cash flows will look very different 
than the cash flows in step one. However, the cash flows will be discounted. So in many cases, the fair value will be lower than the carrying value. And in those situations, if you have the fair value lower than the carrying value, that difference would be the impairment charge companies would be recording in their operations. Now, an important thing to remember is how do I allocate the impairment when I do have an impairment? And it's really based on a pro rata basis, but it's only limited to the long lived assets and the write down is limited to the fair value of those individual assets. So if we move on to the triggering events, we have a slide that provides a list of common triggers within the standard um, that really are helpful to understand what the concept uh, uh, what a concept uh, is of a triggering event, but really the objective of a triggering event is supposed to be an indication that something has occurred that causes you to believe that the asset is not recoverable, i.e. does not pass step one. Uh, but really in light of COVID-19, some of the things that we've seen and some of the things our, our company our companies might be experiencing include the recent market volatility. So for public companies, this means evaluating its market cap or stock price subsequent to year end and really determining the severity and the possible duration of that decline as a possible triggering event in Q1. Other industries might also be experiencing some trouble um, with respect to demand for a specific product or service. So if you think about the hospitality space, hotels, restaurants, um, Think about the airline industry. Um, there's been recent cancellation of concerts, major sporting events, and leagues have pushed back their start of the season. So all these things will impact the demand for those respective industries in 2020. And one thing to, to keep in mind when you're thinking of demand as well is the supply side. So most companies are also experiencing a disruption to its supply chain as a result of COVID-19, which will impact operations and really the ability of that company to provide its product or services. And really here, the key takeaway is in wake of COVID-19, there's a general expectation that companies will need to revisit their cash flow projections to incorporate the impact of certain of these things and really the uncertainty of these items on their expected future operating performance. So if we move on to goodwill and indefinite lives intangibles, you know, this is really the model under ASC 350. And really the assets under this model are tested on an annual basis and in between the annual test, if there's a trigger. Now the test really focuses on whether there's an indication that the carrying value of a reporting unit for goodwill or the ask in the case of indefinite live uh, intangible is higher than the fair value. But one key thing to remember with respect to the goodwill test is this test is really completed at the reporting unit level, which is typically a higher level within the organization. So it tends to include multiple asset groups, which is very different than the previous model I discussed. One other th key thing to remember is that the FASB did simplify the goodwill impairment test. Uh, which we'll discuss in more detail later in the presentation, but it basically moved step two from the old model and really removed a lot of the complexity in the calculation. Now, with respect to public companies, some of the interim events that uh, they might consider in Q1, we've talked about already. We talked about the recent market volatility, the sharp decline in demand and supply for a specific product or service, but really the standard under ASC 350 um, really focuses on recent developments that suggest you either have a potential reduction of future cash flows or you have an increase in the riskiness of those cash flows. So both of these items would typically result in a lower fair value. You know, another key thing to remember is the standard does include a qualitative analysis, which is typically known as step zero. Uh, in light of COVID-19, we believe this step will be less likely used by most companies. Thank you, Miguel. A lot of great points to bring home there. Now, we're talking about a lot of these longer-lived uh, assets, goodwill and other long-lived assets and tangibles. What about when you're looking at things like equity investments, available for sale securities? You know, if, if I'm an equity investee of another company, do I need to look at that other company potentially impairing me? Or do, if I have an equity investee myself in my financial statements, do I need to evaluate that for impairment more so than usual? Like, you know, traditional other than temporary impairments, we're all aware of, but what do we need to look at incrementally during a, a time like this? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Jesus. So, you know, I'm really going to focus on equity investment, equity securities uh, with respect to the fair value and impairment model. So uh, with the adoption of ASU 2016-1, equity investments that are not consolidated or accounted for as equity method investments are carried at fair value with changes in fair value reported in current earnings with one exception. So if the equity investment does not have a relatively determinable fair value and the company elected to apply the measurement alternative under ASC 321, then the model is slightly different. And really these investments are cost method investments uh, under old gap. Really that's what we're talking about here. Now this alternative basically requires the equity investment to be measured its fair value. Now the measurement to fair value is required when there's an impairment or when there is an observable price change for either the same investment or a similar investment with the same issuer. So when you have or when you see a measurement due to these conditions I just talked about, that change or that measurement is reported in current earnings. Now, some of the things to consider under our current environment, uh, there might be more observable transactions in the marketplace with companies really adjusting and modifying their current portfolio based on cash needs now or cash needs in the future. So that's something to keep in mind, which is very important. But really, when you think of the impairment under this model, it's really a qualitative approach. And the standard provides indicators and factors to consider the fair value of this investment is really below its amortized cost basis. But as you imagine, because of the nature of these investments, there's gonna be a lot of judgment required by most companies as these investments are typically in private companies, which are really hard to value. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention uh, has to do with equity method investments, right? So, so just as a reminder, an impairment charge is typically recorded in earnings when the decline in value below the carrying amount is determined to be other than temporary or OTTI. And most companies have to remember that in making this determination, they're going to, they're going to have to evaluate the severity uh, and duration of the decline in value for um, really to complete this analysis. And really they're, what they're going to have to look at is really their intent and ability to hold these investments. And really they're gonna to have to weigh both the positive and negative evidence in terms of evaluating this, uh, these specific investments. But some, of, some examples to consider when making this uh, evaluation is, did the investment have a series of recurring losses? Did that investment incur an impairment charge in the current period? Have other investors stopped funding the investment as the investee defaulted. And really the last one that comes to mind is, has the investees auditors issued a qualified opinion? Miguel, so in the qualified opinion example that you said there, so if, I, if I'm, if I'm an, uh, an investee and there's a qualification of my opinion, does the investor, the financial statements that reflect my investments and in my investment value, does that need to necessarily be impaired just because of that? Or is it the preponderance of this evidence that you've laid out or how, how would that work? What would be the evaluation and the thought process around that? Yeah, that's a great question, Jesus. And it's really going to base, be based on judgment and facts and circumstances. And really what, what the company and, and our clients are going to have to do is they're really going to have to weigh and consider the positive and negative evidence. But I will say that if you have one or two of these examples that I provided, the preponderance of negative evidence is really going to outweigh the positive evidence. And in those situations, you might have an impairment that is other than temporary, meaning you would have to record that investment to its new fair value. So those are some things to consider uh, with respect to that question. But it's a great question, Hazel. Got it. Makes sense, yeah. F facts and circumstances based, like many of the, the judgment calls we, we face in our profession every day. So, okay, so I want to move on. You know, w one thing, we've talked about all these different recoverability issues with these, these different assets. When you think about... Um, a retailer that has price pressure now because of decreased demand because of what's going on, or you think about a manufacturing and distribution company whose normal production is disrupted and now they've got overhead allocation issues and different things. What, what, are, you, what are you suggesting for those types of companies with regard to inventory uh, valuation and the recoverability of the value of the inventory on their books? Sure. So, so with inventory, one key thing to remember is the concept of capacity or production, right? So 
The current guidance does allow overhead to be allocated to inventory based on production. And typically production has a range of normal production, right? Uh, and under these current circumstances and current environment, most companies, if not all, are experiencing abnormal low production, either because they've shut down operations or their facilities have a limited uh, working hours. So all those factors uh, might result in an abnormal low production level. So in those cases, some of these costs should really be expensed in the current period or treated as period costs. But but really the difficult thing here is that there is no clear guidance of what is considered abnormal or normal. And it's really going to be, again, based on facts and circumstances. And again, judgment will be required by, by most companies. However, one, one thing I do want to remind everybody is that the actual evaluation should really be based on historical operating results and historical production ranges. So that's something to keep in mind and it's important to remember. Thank you, Miguel. So this is gonna bring us to our first of three polling questions. So if everyone can make sure for purposes of obtaining your CPE that you answer the polling question. In light of COVID-19, have you started the process of evaluating long-lived assets and goodwill for impairment? Yes or no. So you, your companies, depending what you do for work, your client, whomever it is that would be relevant uh, here. So give everybody 20, 30 seconds to answer the question. In light of COVID-19, have you started the process of evaluating long life assets and goodwill or impairment? Great. And ah, most people have not yet, or their companies haven't. So. I would say we got to get started. Even in our remote uh, financial reporting environment, I think this is one of those critical steps we need to uh, need to start. So um, that note, you know, we, we talked about all these asset recoverability issues. I want to move on to something that's been a theme we've heard about for a while now. Um, ASC 606, the recently uh, implemented accounting standards at a lot of public companies, and, and I would say a lot of private companies by this point as well. Um, ASC 606 came out a few years ago, had a, a very uh, pervasive impact. The, a lot of times maybe just on disclosure, but, but the evaluation was a very, um, a, a very uh, thoughtful evaluation that companies needed to do individually. Um, in regard to COVID-19, a lot of things come into play here. And I want to have Emma Florea talk through some of that. So Emma. Thank you, Jesus. So Public companies have by now all adopted ASC Topic 606 on revenue from contracts with customers. And many private companies have already issued their 2019 financial statements reflecting the adoption of the new standard or, or they're in process of doing so. Now, the list of potential issues is quite extensive depending on facts and circumstances of each company and their related industries. One of the questions we have come across recently is, how might revenue recognition be impacted by a customer's inability to make payments due to the economic environment created by this, by this pandemic? So the revenue recognition standards requires that in order to have a contract and therefore to be able to recognize revenue, a company must conclude that it is probable that it will collect substantially all of the consideration to which, to which it will be entitled under, under a particular arrangement. Now, if a company finds themselves continuing to sell products or services to a customer, although it is uncertain whether collectability is probable, including, for example, um, due to a customer's current inability to, to settle outstanding receivables, now the question is whether revenue can continue to be recognized on new transactions with that particular customer. So in, in many cases, it's likely challenging to conclude that collection for new sales is probable when a customer has been unable to pay their existing receivables. If a company cannot conclude that collection is probable at the inception of an arrangement, then it cannot recognize revenue from that arrangement. So in that case, a company should continue to reassess its conclusion at each reporting period um, as collection may hopefully become probable at a later date. Now, if a company did conclude that collection is not probable, but the customer subsequently does make a payment, revenue can generally only be recognized in certain criteria are met, among which are that the company has no remaining obligations to transfer either goods or services, 
to that customer and the consideration that they collected from that particular customer is non-refundable. Now, if we were to move along to the concept of variable consideration and then the potential need to reassess variable consideration, and especially in this current economic environment, under, under ASC 606, Management typically determines the total transaction price, including any estimate of variable consideration at the inception of a contract, and then management's required to reassess that as estimate at each reporting date. Now, as you may recall, the transaction price is recognized as revenue when or as the related performance obligations are satisfied. And variable consideration in particular is included in the transaction price only to the extent that it is probable that a significant reversal in the amount of revenue recognized will not occur when the specific uncertainty or contingency associated with variable consideration is later on resolved. So estimates of variable considerations are, as you can tell, subject to change as facts and circumstances evolve, and management is required to revise these estimates at each reporting date throughout the contract period. So variable consideration takes many forms. Um, again, as a, as a reminder, among those um, are included, uh, include volume discounts, rebates, returns, refunds, royalties. Um, consideration might also be va variable, for example, if it, if it is contingent on a future event, either occurring or not occurring, such as meeting performance goals, for example. Um, that's an example of that we can think of would be um, an early completion bonus or a commercialization milestone or conversely failing to meet a contractual deadline such as would be the case with the liquidated damages provision in a contract. So on a topic of variable consideration, another question we're seeing quite often now, particularly for companies selling consumer goods is how is revenue recognition going to be impacted if a company expects to receive an increased volume of returns, or if a company relaxes their customer returns policy as a customer accommodation in its current environment. So under the ASC 606 model, when control of goods has transferred to a customer, but the customers have an explicit or implicit right to return products, the amount of revenue recognized is reduced by estimated returns. In that case, the company would recognize a corresponding refund liability for the consideration that, that is expected to be returned to the customer and also an asset for its right to the products that are expected to be recovered from the customer. However, the asset recovery component may need to be written off right away if the products expected to be recovered are also not expected to be in a resellable condition based on really the same, same considerations that you would apply when considering whether a reserve or adjustment is needed against your inventory balances. So again, the, the reduction of revenue for expected returns is a form of variable consideration. So accordingly, the estimates of returns um, and related assets and liabilities that you would set up should be updated each period. So while estimated returns are often based on historical experience, companies do need to consider now any expected changes in customer behavior resulting from this current economic environment in their estimates of um, returns. And additionally, companies should consider whether the estimate is impacted by business practices or communications to customers that are happening right now outside of the contract, specifically uh, as would be the case when there's an additional willingness to take returns outside of the state of return period as an accommodation to um, for companies' customers. So Emma, um, we've talked about revenue recognition and the impact, potentially less revenue, hence less cash flow, hence lower cash flow to project in valuation models that um, attempt to value some of the assets that Miguel talked about earlier, right? So this cascading effect. Now, one of the things that many times is an afterthought, and we just want to make sure we highlight it to the group here is when you think about, um, you know, uh, your, your taxes, a lot of companies, whether for cumulative, you know, cumulative losses that it had historically or otherwise have built up deferred tax assets, some with no valuation allowances, some with insufficient valuation allowances that would pretty much uh, need to be revisited in a time like this. So can you talk a little bit about 
the considerations given to the recoverability of deferred tax assets, valuation allowances, and also touch on effective tax rate considerations in light of COVID-19? Absolutely. So if we move along to our next slide, um, we outline here various considerations related to, um, to the impact on income taxes. Um, one particular one, um, you know, going in line with, with kind of the, the, the trend and, and the need for valuation allowances that, that we've discussed so far is, um, you know, companies must assess the need for evaluation allowance on deferred tax assets at each reporting period. So ASC 740 on income taxes indicates that all available evidence should be considering when assessing this need for evaluation allowance. And all available evidence typically includes historical information as well as all currently available information about future years. And much of that has changed very rapidly in just the past few weeks. Now, if, if any of you have, for example, not yet issued your financial statements for 2019, you need to consider that events occurring subsequent to a company's period end, but before the financial statements are released, that do in fact provide additional evidence regarding the likelihood of realization of existing deferred tax assets, should also be considered when determining whether evaluation allowance is needed. Um, going along with that, you know, ASC 740 does indicate that it is difficult to avoid evaluation allowance when there is negative evidence, such as cumulative losses in recent years. And losses expected in early future years and uncertainties um, whose unfavorable resolution would, would potentially adversely affect future results are also considered negative evidence that, that must be um, contemplated in this analysis. So the key takeaway here is that even if a company has generated net income in recent years, companies need to consider projections of near-term future losses, including if they will result in a cumulative, cumulative loss position. Now, given the proximity of the first quarter, to the release of a company's calendar year and financial statements, it's typically unusual to have a significant change in the valuation allowance assessment um, during Q1 of 2020 compared to that reached in the prior year annual financial statement. However, as, as we've noted so far, given the rapid change in the economic environment, companies may in fact face circumstances at the end of this first quarter in 2020 that were not known or anticipated at the time of issuance of their 2019 financial statement. So recent results and also revised projections might in fact differ significantly from the assumptions used in reaching conclusions at year end. And so if operating results have deteriorated or if other negative evidence has developed, it would be appropriate for the company to revisit prior conclusions. Now, even if there's no change in prior conclusions during Q1 of 2020, it might be appropriate to enhance what is referred to as early warning disclosures. That goes particularly for, for public companies. Yeah, well, that's a great point. The early warning disclosure, I know the SEC has been adamant about that. It, I remember even a couple of years back, a few years back when they were really uh, pushing for early disclosures around contingencies where companies couldn't go from you know, having no liability recorded for, you know, whatever it may be, a potential litigation or whatever, and going from either, you know, nothing or remote all the way to, you know, something that you record on your financials. They want to see a steady spectrum, you know, uh, along the way of, you know, when you're, when should you start signaling to the user the financial statements? And I think the same thing would apply here from a, from a tax perspective. So um, appreciate those comments. I want to move along to um, maybe some of the contractual arrangements that in today's world we see changes now on, on lease accounting, you know, just like revenue, it was a new standard, even more recent than, than revenue recognition. And, and uh, you'll see later on, actually, there's, a, there's another deferral now related to the implementation of lease accountings that, uh, that uh, the FASB is allowing for, particularly in light of COVID-19. Um, but, but just regarding contractual arrangements and modifications that uh, tenants are seeking from landlords and also, uh, you know, force majeure provisions and contracts that we've been hearing a lot about that, how those things would be handled. So, Dennis, why don't you walk us through some of the lease accounting uh, implications here in light of COVID-19? Thank you, Jesus. Absolutely. So, as Jesus mentioned, um, there has been a 
Sasby vote for a deferral on the, uh, the adoption of the lease standard for certain companies. I, I know that within our audience, there might be a bit of division on who is currently applying ASC 840 versus ASC 842. So as we kind of go through some of these topics, I'm going to give a bit of a breakdown as to how each of them would be dealt with from each standard's eyes. So one of, one of the first questions we've been receiving was um, related to the uh, discount rate that would be used for valuing new operating and finance leases under ASC 842, or in the case of ASC 840, how we would value capital leases. Now, companies, despite the volatile interest rate environment, are still encouraged to apply the guidance in using their incremental borrowing rate, or in some cases, the rate implicit of the lease. Specifically for ASC 842, you should be using the implicit rate of the lease. However, if that isn't really available or readily available for you to determine, you may use the incremental borrowing rate. For our ASC 840 applicants, for the valuation of capital leases, the incremental borrowing rate should be used. However, if it's practicable to determine the lessor's implicit rate, and if that implicit rate is lower than your incremental borrowing rate, you should go ahead and opt in to use that. Another question would be, uh, when, when it comes to modifications of leases, uh, would you be treating that differently from an accounting approach than the impairment of an operating lease, or, or in some cases, a capital lease or a finance lease? Uh, the, the answer to this would be that yes, you should be accounting for this very differently. In the case of a modification, you would basically be updating the lease liabilities amount and uh, posting a contem contemporaneous adjustment to the right of use asset also recorded under ASC 842. For ASC 840, a modification may trigger a change in classification of the lease. So for example, if you were uh, previously accounting for it as an operating lease, the modification may trigger a change in classification to a capital lease. So I, I encourage the audience to kind of go back and look at these agreements to make sure that you're still accounting for it in the same classification that you should be based on the modification. In the case of an impairment, uh, you, you would also apply this a little differently under ASC 842 versus ASC 840. For ASC 842, an impairment would be recognized on the right of use asset, and from this date, you would effectively delink the right of use asset from the lease liability. Now, the accounting for the lease liability will remain unchanged. You're still going to use the effective interest method in terms of uh, amortizing that liability, but in the case of the right of use asset, from the date of the impairment charge, you're going to you're going to record an expense, and the remaining life on that right of use asset will then be amortized from the date of impairment to the earlier of its and end useful life or the end of the lease term. For those of you that are still applying ASC 840, you're going to need to evaluate your capital leases for impairment using uh, to, the, to the effect that the model uh, Miguel had mentioned in the beginning of the slides, ASC 360, you would, you would basically look at the impairment guidance for long-lived assets. So, so moving on, uh, we, we also have some questions on um, force majeure provisions, basically uh, unforeseen circumstances that weren't necessarily there at the uh, inception of the lease, just things that are beyond anyone's control. Uh, would this be a little bit different from a modification of the lease? And the answer to that would be yes. Your, your standard lease modifications would still follow the uh, lease modification guidance under ASC 842 and 840, whereas a change due to the activation of a force majeure may not necessarily modify the terms of the lease, but it may affect the payment structure of the lease going forward. So you would need to account for that under the variable lease payment guidance. On the other hand, um, there are some lease agreements that may have a covenant associated with them that may not have initially been recorded in the measurement of the lease liability and asset due to the fact that it was not really probable that the covenant would be triggered. Uh, in light of the recent circumstances from COVID-19, that assessment may, no, may be a bit stale. Uh, if there is a possibility of the covenant being triggered, it should be evaluated whether that is probable and on the date that it's determined to be probable, you should include the full potential default amount in the lease asset and liability. And for our ASC 840 applicants, that would be in the capital lease liability and capital lease asset. Thank you, Dennis. You know, as, as we think through some of these contractual arrangements that folks are trying to renegotiate in, in a time like this, you know, I'm kind of thinking through what other parties, uh, organizations deal with uh, on, a, on, a, on a frequent basis where they can be impacted. And, you know, obviously lenders come to mind. So when we, when we think through dealing with a bank, and also I know we have some folks that are on this webinar that are banks themselves. We have some banking clients and other financial institutions. So maybe touching on it from a lender perspective too. Um, but, you know, I, I know there's some reprieve from the regulators and, uh, on, on, on the accounting from the lender side, not necessarily from, from 
uh, you know, a non-lending organization or non-financial institution, but maybe talk through some of the debt covenant impacts that we would expect and some of the modifications along the lines of dealing with, uh, with your lender. Oh, absolutely. I, I would say that in light of the current environment, I would say that the need for assessing uh, the meeting of certain covenants as well as uh, the treatment for certain modifications of loans is going to be a bit rampant at the time. Uh, I guess starting off with covenants, I would encourage the audience who are parties to a lending arrangement to evaluate their debt for, uh, for meeting certain covenants at the balance sheet date, because this very well could affect the classification of your debt on the balance sheet. Uh, specifically, if you evaluate at the balance sheet date that you're not meeting your covenant, you should be classifying any long-term debt as current, as that would basically trigger the debt to be puttable. Uh, there are some exceptions to this. If you're able to uh, negotiate with your lender and they waive their right to put the debt for at least 12 months and no less than that, then you very well could um, classify it as non-current, but that, that isn't the end of the road. You would also still need to do a probability test on future non-compliance. Now, if you, uh, if you get a waiver on 331, but you, you're under the impression that you're definitely going to be triggering that covenant on 630 again, then you should still be classifying it as current regardless of the waiver. Now, I would also like to mention that even though you get a waiver for one reporting period, if you do trigger the covenant again, you would need to renew that waiver with the lender because they only waived one instance of non-compliance. They very well still could put the debt on another date of non-compliance. Also, for those of you who do meet your covenants at the uh, end of the reporting period, if you do find that you're no longer meeting your covenant maybe the next month end and you still haven't issued your financial statements, you would still classify the debt as non-current, but you should uh, include disclosure in your financial statements of the triggering of the covenant subsequent to the balance sheet date. Uh, another topic, and not necessarily a covenant per se, but many term loan agreements may include uh, material adverse change clause. So basically, uh, due to the change in the environment from COVID-19, uh, certain lenders may consider this a material event that could could very well allow them to put the debt. So I encourage the audience to kind of look back into some of their term loan agreements to make sure uh, if there are clauses of this nature that you, you're kind of privy to them and are, are aware of the possibility that the debt could be put. Once you've kind of gotten past the covenants, uh, you would need to kind of evaluate any restructurings that do happen to debt and specifically from the borrower side, if these are considered troubled debt restructurings. Jesus had mentioned that there is certain reprieve for TDR accounting uh, for certain entities, specifically financial institutions under the CARES Act. Now, in order to meet this uh, reprieve, you would need to only apply this to loans that were not 30 days past due as of December 31st, 2019. The lender would then be allowed to suspend TDR accounting on such loans until the earlier of 60 days after the COVID-19 emergency is terminated or December 31st, 2020. Keep in mind that this is really only a reprieve for credit impacts that are related to COVID-19. If the loan credit impact was not related to the virus and was kind of due to pre-existing conditions, you still would have to implement TDR accounting. On the debtor side, you need to assess your, T uh, your loan restructurings for TDR treatment. And the TDR requirements are one of two things, well, two, two specific requirements. The first one being that the lender must be offering a concession with the modification. Now, I know that a modification may generally seem to be a concession just, just from face value, but you really need to make sure you measure the effective borrowing rate of the restructured debt and compare it to the effective borrowing rate of the original debt. If you end up with a lower effective borrowing rate on your restructured debt, then it is indeed a concession. On the, on the other requirement is more qualitative in nature. You need to be experiencing financial difficulty as a borrower. Now, in, in light of these current circumstances, I would say that any modification that meets the first requirement, it probably is uh, due to financial difficulty that a modification is being requested. Once you've evaluated whether you need to treat it as a TDR, if, if you do conclude that it's not a TDR uh, treated loan, you would still need to perform a 10% test uh, consistent with the guidance on whether the restructuring is considered a modification of the debt or an extinguishment. And you do this by measuring the change in net present value of cash flows of the original debt versus the new debt. If your change in net present value of cash flows is under 10% of the original value, you're dealing with a modification of your debt. Now, the accounting for this is a little different than an extinguishment on a modification. You're not recording any gain or loss in your income statement, but you are establishing a new effective interest rate based on the revised calculation. However, in the case of an extinguishment where your change in net present value of cash flows is over 10%, you would be derecognizing the old debt, 
recording the new debt at fair value, and the differential would be recorded as a gain or a loss in your income statements. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> I think, you know, that I appreciate you adding that uh, technical point on the 10% test at the end. I know we see uh, a lot of times organizations miss that, uh, that test of whether something's technically a modification and you don't record an extinguishment, you know, especially when it's uh, terms are modified with the same financial institutions and things like that. So I think that was a, a great point to highlight. You know, I, I want to go now to a, a, a topic that's, um, uh, you know, something that historically, you know, maybe there's a debate between whether a subsequent event is a type one or a type two. And I know management teams and their audit firms have debated over that a while, or also, you know, management teams recently having to uh, undertake their own going concern assessments, whereas back in the day, it was really more of an audit thing. Um, I think there's a little more, you know, there's a little more consensus around what's going on now being, you know, a type two event and, and, and it's disclosable, uh, you know, likely disclosable. What, what are, what's the robustness behind the disclosure? What are the things that warrant uh, disclosures for sure? What are management teams needing to do from a going concern perspective, looking at their cash burn? What's different now that wasn't around before COVID-19? I would say that in light of COVID-19, uh, there is definitely a focus on transparency and robustness of financial disclosures uh, as it relates to subsequent events. Um, a lot of a lot of companies throughout various industries are being adversely affected from the impacts, whether it be their closure of businesses, uh, certain geographic locations might be um, experiencing difficulties in this situation. So it would be encouraged to include a type two subsequent event in your financial statements that may or may not quantify the uh, estimates of the effects. Um, but I guess the best way to kind of go through this would be an example, because really what we're looking at here is ASC 275 in terms of concentration. And this is what you would be disclosing for a subsequent event. So for example, I, I like to shop at Gap when it comes to my pants. So uh, every, every time I need a new pair of pants, I go to Gap and you know, I, I kind of need it because after all this self quarantining and social distancing, uh, my pants aren't necessarily gap compliant. So if I was trying to go to gap right now, I would probably be experiencing reduced store hours or maybe in some, in some adverse cases, complete store closures. Now for gap, their, their revenue is really from their storefronts. And if these storefronts are closed, they very well might not uh, have a very good second quarter. Um, the, this would be material uh, information for investors. Uh, they would want to know this and kind of maybe, if possible, quantified as a subsequent event disclosure. So we, we are encouraging, and it's probably going to be compulsory for a subsequent event of a type two nature to be included in the financial statements. From a going concern perspective, um, a go, the management's going concern assessment should definitely incorporate the impact of COVID-19. You should talk about the extent of operational disruption. You should talk about potential diminished demand any current obligations that are due and, you know, your access to credit facilities, as well as any other factors that can really assist in determining whether you're going to continue as a going concern from the year, uh, from the year, for a year following the issuance of the financial statements, or in the case of private companies, the day the financial statements are available to be issued. Thank you, Dennis. So that's going to bring us actually now to our uh, second of uh, three polling questions. Do borrowers need to assess their loan restructurings for TDR accounting. So the key word there is borrowers. Do borrowers need to assess their loan restructurings for TDR accounting? A, yes. B, no, borrowers never need to assess this. Or C, no, the CARES Act provides a temporary reprieve from assessing. Everybody, a uh, little bit of time here. Remember to answer your polling question for your CPE credit, please. Okay, and the polling results show that no, no, yes. All right, an overwhelming yes, 71%. That's the right, uh, the right answer. They do need to, uh, to assess their loan restructurings for TDR accounting. So thank you, everyone. And we're gonna move on. I'm gonna make a few comments just on uh, SEC reporting. A lot of this was covered arguably by some of the asset recoverability matters that Miguel talked about and even some of what uh, Emma and Dennis talked about, but just specific to SEC reporting, the SEC recently provided a 45 day grace period for uh, public filings that go all the way through July 1, 2020. So um, you've got to file a Form 8K, which a public company would have to file anytime there's a material event. This would be considered a material event. They would avail themselves of this provision 
And uh, in an example uh, that, that we're actually recently dealing with, you have a calendar year public company, a small public filer that has a 1231 year end and would be required to file their Form 10-K by the end of March. In that situation, they're trying to benefit from that provision that would take them to mid-May. So they would be able to take that 45 day grace period with the uh, with the 8K filing. So that's one of the one of the major changes. And uh, the chairman of the SEC, Jake Clayton, as well as the director of the Division of Corporation Finance, William Hooman, he uh, they came out with a public release recently that talked about a, a lot of uh, the perspectives the SEC is having on, uh, on, on on the current environment, the perspectives that they share. So one of the other matters regards to disclosures for um, uh, anything that would be uh, a significant judgment or an estimate. So in the examples that we discussed earlier, when we talk about changes in cash flow that would result in valuation changes, um, you know, there may be instances where perhaps you do not have an impairment, but there could be maybe, you know, you're, you have a decrease in, uh, uh, in your interest rate and an increase in your cash flow and whatever other noise is, is under that. And, and ultimately you're pretty close, but you're not there. Well, that quote unquote pretty close to the SEC means that you need to be transparent with the user of the financial statements and you need to disclose, hey, we understand we used a 2% discount rate, but had we used, you know, a quarter of a point different, you know, we would have had this, uh, this impairment charge. So they want to see those, they want, they've always wanted to see that and they really, in light of this, want, want, want to make sure they see that. Um, one other comment regarding SEC enforcement. So similar to the way that I'm sure the IRS, you know, also at a federal level, will be looking at things like this. The SEC is going to be making sure that they increase their uh, efforts in looking for offenders, anybody who's trying to perpetrate schemes around this, any, anybody trying to pull a fast one and gain the system. Um, you know, again, just like the IRS, just like state and local governments are looking at that, the SEC's enforcement division is going to be scrutinizing that pretty heavily. Um, one thing I want to mention here on, on non-GAAP financial measures. So those of you who have dealt with public company reporting in one way or another for a while now would, would probably uh, uh, understand that the SEC frowns upon a, a lot of, of non-GAAP measures that, that companies would, would initially try to put out there. And so at the very uh, beginning of some rulemaking, they made it very, very clear uh, the, the reconciliations that needed to be made to gap measures and all that good stuff. So when you now look at it in light of COVID-19, they want to make sure that companies aren't just trying to make things look rosy um, and not take everything into effect. So for example, if you have charges you need to take, again, in relation to everything we're talking about here, impairments of assets or you know, lease modification differences that are going to flow through your P&L in one, one way or another, the uh, SEC wants to make sure that everything good and bad goes in there and that you're not just trying to paint Roy that, you know, the picture would have been rosier had it not been for this. There may be things that would have happened anyway. Um, there are also things that, that are coming in as a benefit. For example, you could take impairment charges, but if you know that the $2.2 trillion package, you're going to benefit from that and you've got some cash that came in or you're expecting to came in, you've got to model that as well. So they just really want, you know, transparency and, and, and appropriate non-GAAP financial measure reporting to the extent companies choose to do that. Um, you know, they are allowing for uh, non-GAAP financial measures to be reconciled to provisional GAAP amounts, and then you'd have to disclose, uh, you know, when those provisional amounts would, you know, when the accounting would be, uh, would be complete. Um, and then the other thing, you know, regarding subsidiaries, the SEC is generally frowned upon excluding subsidiaries, um, but, you know, you can modify results of subsidiaries to the extent it makes sense and just have appropriate disclosure if there's, you know, subsidiaries that are you know, waiting on to close for whatever reason and they're directly impacted by this. So, um, so lo lots of scrutiny from the SEC on this and, and there, there will be more to come, I am sure. So on that note, I want to go ahead and pass it to Emma, who's going to talk about some of the financial reporting reminders for this year, starting with a deferral of effective dates of some accounting standard implementations. And then she's going to also talk about some new accounting standards, including uh, ASU related to goodwill impairment testing and some cloud computing arrangements. So, uh, Emma? Thanks, Asus. So, last week, the FASB held a public meeting to approve certain measures intended to provide some, some accounting relief and clarity during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. So, among the items discussed and decided was the issuance of a proposal, which is widely expected to, to be ultimately approved and it's very, very welcomed by, by stakeholders to 
provide certain private companies and not-for-profit organizations with an optional one-year effective date delay um, of the leases standards and some other standards listed here on, um, on our slide. Now, moving along to, to the next slide, we also wanted to highlight a few accounting standards that public companies in particular will be adopting in Q1 of 2020. So keep in mind, this is not a complete list of new standards which are effective in Q1. And um, along with this, we also outline the effective date for all other entities, other public business entities, um, which may early adopt uh, some of these standards. So moving, moving along, we, we wanted to dive into a little more detail regarding the new simplified goodwill impairment test. So this new standard, it's been out for quite some, some time and it's required to be adopted by SEC filers this year. The one exception to that being smaller reporting companies. Small reporting companies and all other types of entities, um, private entities as well, are not required to adopt the standard until 2023 for um, calendar year and companies, but early adoption is permitted and we do think this might be of interest to private companies as well. From, from the standpoint of early adoption. So to walk through exactly what actually changed and wherein lies the simplification. Under the old guidance, as step one of the impairment test, a company would have to compare the fair value of a reporting unit with its carrying value. And that step has remained unchanged under the new guidance as well. Now, to the extent that the carrying value exceeded the fair value of a reporting unit, under the old guidance, a company would have to perform step two of the impairment analysis, and that would require a company to calculate what is referred to as implied goodwill. So to calculate implied goodwill, a company would have to fair value all of the assets and liabilities included in the reporting unit, which would include, for example, unrecognized intangible assets like in-process R&D. And then you would deduct that amount from the fair value of the reporting unit to come up with this implied goodwill amount. Then the implied goodwill amount would be compared to the carrying amount of goodwill. And to the extent that the carrying amount still exceeded that implied goodwill amount, a company would then recognize an impairment charge. Now, under this new standard, step two goes away. And that therein lies the simplification. So a company would perform that step one evaluation that I mentioned, and they would stop there. So if their value was less than the carrying amount of a reporting unit, a company would recognize an impairment charge for that difference, but that charge would be capped at the amount of goodwill that has been allocated to the reporting unit. So as you can tell so far, these changes seem um, like they could accelerate the timing of an impairment charge. And under the old guidance, a company could theoretically fail step one, but not recognize an impairment charge based on the outcome of, of the step two assessment. Whereas under the new model, once you fail step one, you're going to recognize an impairment charge. So this only this doesn't really only accelerate the timing of when the impairment charge is recognized, but it might also affect the amount of the impairment charge recognized as well. Um, there are several re disclosure requirements that come along with this new standard. Um, one of which is that companies that have reporting units that have either a zero or negative carrying amount are required to disclose the amount of goodwill allocated to those reporting units and also to disclose the reportable segment in which those reporting units are included. So overall, this new guidance is much simpler to apply and it just eliminates this need for a company to go through this hypothetical purchase accounting exercise to figure out the amount of goodwill, the amount of, of implied goodwill in particular. So as a reminder, this, the standard is effective prospectively. So for example, consider a company which failed step one in 2019, but they passed step two. So no impairment charge was recognized in 2019. Now, once the calendar has turned to 2020, the company likely has an impairment indicator in the first quarter of 2020. So they would have to apply the new simplified goodwill impairment test and likely they would have to recognize an impairment charge in earnings in the first quarter of the year because of the perspective transition of the standard. Um, the guidance doesn't um, doesn't affect the qualitative screen that uh, Miguel had described earlier or, or so-called step zero. 
which is included in existing guidance. And once this new guidance is adopted, um, it would have to be applied both um, to the annual test and any interim impairment test. So moving along to ASU 2018-15 on cloud computing arrangements, we also wanted to focus on some changes related to the standard for any of you who are in process of um, implementing a new uh, a new ERP, for example, or any other type, of, have any other type of cloud computing arrangement um, to which this might, might apply. So the standard addresses accounting by the customer who has purchased cloud computing services and how companies will have to think about the implementation costs related to those. So the standard is sort of specific about what's included within its scope. So here we're talking about cloud computing arrangements or hosting arrangements that are service contracts. So this new standard does not apply to contracts that include a software license, and it also does not impact any fees that are paid to a third-party um, software provider that are currently recognized as service fees or as a service component. Those types of fees that you pay for licenses, like those would continue to be expensed as incurred. But the new guidance focuses on implementation costs. For example, if you are in the application development stage and you're incurring costs, let's say related to coding or, or configuration or, or some, some type of customization, um, now you get to look at the internal use software guidance to determine whether you meet the criteria to capitalize those costs. And costs that are capitalized on the balance sheet are then amortized over the length of the contract plus any reasonably determined renewal period. And specifically, you begin amortization when a component of the internal use software is ready for its intended use. So that component does not have to be placed in service yet, but once it's ready for its intended use, then you would start the amortization process. Another key point around this guidance is that it's very specific in terms of presentation requirements, specifically where that asset should be recorded and where the expense should be recorded on the financial statement. So the guidance says that the asset and the expense should be recognized in the same line items that you would otherwise recognize a service component. So for example, if you have currently an asset for prepaid service fees, likely this is going to end up, any costs that you're capitalizing are likely going to end up in a prepaid position in the balance sheet. And on the income statement, you are going to recognize the amortization expense in the same line item as the service costs that you are currently expensing. Now, this is an important distinction because if you are using the internal use software guidance for other costs and you are capitalizing those, the guidance does not currently specify where the asset needs to be recorded on the balance sheet. And currently there are some differences in practice where some companies might include the asset in PPNE or intangibles, but the new guidance is, is clear that if you are in, in, in the scope of this new guidance, you would record um, any capitalized costs on the same line item as you would otherwise record a service component. And with that, just as a final reminder, the standard um, can be early adopted by, by private companies, and it can be adopted either prospectively or retrospectively. Thank you very much, Emma. That was very insightful and lots in the pipeline. Uh, we want to go ahead and we're uh, about to wrap up here in the next two to three minutes. So we're right on time. I, I do want to bring the third and final polling question up so that we can uh, have our audience answer for their CPE credit. Do you plan to early adopt ASU 2017-04 simplifying goodwill impairment testing? Yes, you plan to adopt it. No, you're not sure, or you already adopted it. Give everybody a uh, little bit of time here. Hey, thank you. So most people, the majority of people are not sure with, with no as a second place uh, answer.